Cathy. The significance of the 10,000, of course, is that was an election promised by Barry O'Farrell that any petition of 10,000 would be seriously considered as a representative view of the people. So that'll shortly be put to the test. Look, it's a, it's a pleasure to welcome the local member here. And uh, at the risk of embarrassing her, not only does she do one hell of a job representing you, secondly, she does have brains and can read documents, but she's currently the minister in charge of an appalling portfolio, a terrible, an enormous thing of community services where every day she ministers to kids who are abused and, and totally disadvantaged, and she does it outstandingly. Now, of course, she carries this further burden of representing these concerns in an area outside her portfolio. I've known her for a thousand years. I can tell you, this woman you can have faith and believe in, but she cannot do it on her own. Would you please welcome Prue Goward? Well, thank you, Alan. And it's wonderful to see so many people here today. When we began this, uh, well, over, only just over a year ago, when we met in that hall at Sutton Forest, there were four or five hundred of us on a very wet night, uh, and we said then it would be tough. We said then that there would be a range of obstacles, and so it has proven to be. Uh, and I think that uh, today is an opportunity to hear more about the, the fact that we are not alone, that this is happening all over Australia as uh, the two largest countries in the world discover economic growth uh, and we, uh, in some senses, are the beneficiaries of that, and in other senses, it has exposed communities like this uh, to a threat that we have never envisaged before. Uh, in every opportunity, there is a threat, and sadly, our rural communities are bear bearing the burden of this particular one. So I won't go through, as has already been done, uh, the arguments in favour of supporting agriculture and of preserving these communities. You know that and you've heard that. I won't go through the arguments about the importance of pre preserving the aquifer, both for our use and for Sydney's use. You know that. And I do reiterate, and I'm confident of this, that if the moment you start to mine through that aquifer, there is no way you can do that without destroying it. The design of aquifers particularly the Hawkesbury sandstone aquifers, is that that sandstone works as a wonderful filtration plant. You know those little things you put on your kitchen top where you filter, it, filter out your own water? This is a giant water filter that presents and gives us the purest water in New South Wales and wonderful water for Sydney. I have to say, when it comes to prime agricultural land, we have not been kind to ourselves here. I remember when I was Sex Discrimination Commission, that's a long way away from land use policy, I can tell you, I wrote about the importance of preserving agricultural land because the journey from my farm to Sydney every week reminded me of how much land we were continuously giving up to urban development. Uh, I, the, the farm, the farm that has just been bought, I would say deceitfully and duplicitously by Hume Cole, that farm was already slated for re redevelopment as, a, as, a, as a, a small subdivision. We had already given that land away. So we have to remember that we can play a part in this at many levels of government and at the local government level. And we have, I think, a wonderful council with a wonderful commitment to the area. We must never forget that ultimately land use uh, and the loss of agricultural land is as much a responsibility of local government as it is of the state. May I now move to what we do about this? And I think that we have to accept that there needs to be a process. In the run-up to the election, you will remember that there was no process. In fact, let me remind you of three wicked, wicked words that this community and communities all over New South Wales fought against as part of that campaign. And those three words were Part 3A. And Part 3A allowed the former government to decide on the minister's whim or behest or whatever, whether he or she wanted to approve a development. 
and they approved all sorts of developments because the minister thought it was a good idea. And we hated it because we knew what that meant. It meant corruption, it meant uh, impropriety, it meant the improper use of our land. And that's why we sought to remove it, and that's why the coalition in opposition committed to abolishing Part 3A. But it has to be replaced with a process. That was the point. There was no process. And what we are developing is a process. Now, impatience and passion are great drivers of change. And we need to harness that impatience, which is why the petition is so important, uh, which is why your letters to the ministers involved are so important. By the way, there are four of them, not just one. Uh, the Minister for Mines is one, but in fact the Minister who will make the decision, is the, as they should, be the Minister for Planning, on the advice of the Ministers for uh, the Environment, the Minister for Primary Industries and Water, and the Minister for uh, Resources and Energy. That process has been underway, it's been referred to. The development of an aquifer interference regulation uh, and the development of strategic land use plans. Now, Having said that it takes time, let, re, we, let me remind you, we banned evaporation ponds as soon as we got in. We banned BTEX chemicals in fracking. We immediately introduced a regulation that required a water access li license for uh, mining exploration activities that took three megalitres per year. Uh, and we have allowed no developments of mining since we have been in. We also did re introduce agricultural impact statements. That's what we did on day more or less one in the terms of governments. Uh, it, everything is slow, but that's what we did in the beginning. And we're now developing the right policy. As Larry said, we expect that uh, land, that, that um, aquifer interference regulation to be ready before Christmas and the, uh, uh, the strategic land plans to be ready sometime next year. Now, you must be impatient. And you must write, and you must ring, and you must sign the petition, and it must be debated. And don't think that there is no politician in that parliament who is not on your side. There are many of us with communities exactly like this one who will argue the case and do argue the case very strongly. One of the great things about it being a national Liberals government is that we finally have people representing rural communities in the government and it's making an enormous difference to the uh, intensity and the critical nature of the debate that's now occurring within the government. But I ask you to accept this. Democracy is based on the rule of law. Now, we can, as Gandhi did, and as we've been advised to do today, protest. That's not the sort of rule of law I'm talking about. I'm talking about proper process. I'm talking about getting a land use plan and getting an aquifer regulation that stands the test of the courts, that stands the test of the Supreme Court and the High Court, because the last thing you want is for your case to be the test case and to fail because we didn't develop a good enough regulation. Because in the, in the time it will then take a government to get back into the parliament, and by God, I've seen a lot of regulations come back to the parliament because the government pushed it through so quickly and so badly, they had to be redone. By the time that gets back and goes through the proper processes, you'll be mining out there on that farm. There'll be, a, there'll be an application done and dusted because they will have won in the court. Now, you can, you can agree to abolish the courts if you like. You can agree to, to go back to part 3A and believe that you've got a virtuous government that will, because we believe, agree that there should be no mining here and there is no process needed. But I think we all know that the courts will challenge that. The Constitution challenges that. The whole way civilised democracies do business will, will challenge that. We have to accept that we need to get this right. We need to work it, we need to consult, we need the expertise from all sides. We need to hear the miners' objections so we know how to uh, draft that regulation so that that objection is accounted for, so that we've managed it. If we don't have the miners in the room, I can tell you what will happen. 
We won't know until we get into the High Court and are told. So you may believe that we have to do this, but I want you to accept that you have a government that heard the lesson, heard the message very clearly on March the 26th, knows what it's doing and knows that the last thing this community wants or any community wants is for a regulation that will fail, that will let you down, let us down and let the future down. So I congratulate you on being here today. I hope that you accept the processes of governments as I sadly have had to accept when it comes to saving the lives of children, take time to change, uh, but that we have a very deep, deep commitment to doing this. May I just say, make a, a comment finally about staff shortages in our departments? Uh, and as many people have said already today, partly the shortage of um, uh, staff is driven by the fact that the mining companies are taking the best people. As Alan referred to earlier, all the lobbyists are the best people, the best former politicians, the deputy prime ministers and the like. And they're also including in that take bureaucrats. And it's, it's not a joke that we have 22 vacant positions in one section in the Department of Resources and, and Energy. It is a manifestation, another manifestation of the mining boom because those people are bought out with offers that we cannot match. And in order to match them, of course, we would certainly have to breach that 2.5% gap uh, cap we have placed on wage increases, and I don't think we'd be thanked for that. It's a very difficult job. I might remind you that, of course, that money, that money that drives those salaries is, for the most part, not Australian money. It's POSCO's money, it's the Koreans' money, it's the Chinese money. And that is a foreign investment issue. And I'm thrilled that Bill is here today to see how strongly you feel about it because, Bill, as you know, that is a challenge for the federal parliament. Our government has already written and made very clear to Canberra uh, that we want to see at least a moratorium on the foreign ownership of land and investment in land-related activities such as this. And we need... We need the federal parliament to get behind this because we can't do it on our own and we can't stop the money without the support of the federal government. Which means, as I said right in the beginning, all three levels of government signing up with a common purpose, which is to save not, the, not just this area, but to save our land, our people, our future to recognise that the long-term interest of Australia is ironically not in being a mine, but in being a food bowl. I thank you.